because Moses Caicedo was another example, you know, just in the January transfer window that just went, Chelsea bidded, I don't know, 55 million and Arsenal obviously built, bid £70 million. Pounds, and I was doing some research. So, they say. so, so they, they say. So they say. say. Obviously, you're the man. I noticed that. I wasn't nodding. <laughs> <laughs>
It's uh, still got a long way to go. I think that's the first and important thing to say because um, you know you don't get prizes in March. You get them at the end of the season. So we, we've still got a lot of football to play. We've got a lot of hard work to, to get through, but we've enjoyed it. We've played really good football. We've scored a lot of goals. I think we've upset maybe the, the bigger teams um, from time to time, which is always good, I think, not only for us, but also for the league as a whole, because I think it gives everyone you know faith and confidence that there is a real competition every season. Um, but we also know um, that we've got more to do and uh, we've, we've got a very big game tomorrow night against Crystal Palace. We've got uh, an even bigger game, arguably, on Sunday in the quarterfinal of the FA Cup. Easy to underestimate a team in League Two, but we can't afford to do that because they've already knocked out a Premier League team on their own ground in the last round. So we've got a real opportunity this season to improve on our best ever league position and hopefully try and get ourselves back to Wembley again uh, for at least an FA Cup semi-final. But we've still got a lot of hard work to do. So before the season starts, you obviously have goals. And where Brighton find themselves in the table right now, it's a lofty position. I think most bookmakers or experts in football might have not foreseen where Brighton are right now. So do you still have those pre-season goals in mind or is it sort of like wow this is exceeding <laughs> expectation we need to revise that sort of projection and make a new one well one of the club's values is is about exceeding expectations so we're, we're always striving really hard to, to to be better than the previous season to prove people wrong to try and surprise people our, our long-term aim is to be a, a, a consistent top 10 club in the premier league um and that may not sound like the most exciting objective, but when you're at a club that spent most of its time in the bottom two divisions of English uh, football, um, then actually that's an incredible achievement if you're able to do that. And of course, if you are able to be in the top 10 on a regular basis, it also gives you the chance of European football. And it gives you the chance of maybe pushing to go into the final stages of the cup competitions. If we were able to do that, it would be an incredible achievement for, for the club as a whole. Um, but we're also realistic and humble that there are a lot of other clubs out there that are that's trying to do the same. Yeah. And therefore, every game feels at the moment like it's a cup final. At Leeds on Saturday, you know, we were twice ahead in the mm -hmm. game. Yeah. There's 35, 36,000 fans there screaming for Leeds to, to get back into the game. And of course, they did twice. And, you know, they're the sorts of games that actually we've all worked for. We all want to play, you know, in the Premier League in games like that. But each week, it, it seems to get harder and harder. So, you know, we're seventh in the table as we speak today. And that's amazing. But it is only March and, and there's a lot of games to play. And in regards to like a game versus like Crystal Palace, our preparation is a little bit different around the training ground. Are things happening that don't usually happen? What happens before a game like Crystal, Crystal well, it's Palace? Well, it's a derby game. So <laughs> you know that it doesn't just mean a lot to the players. It means a hell of a lot to the fans as well. Uh, not just our fans, but obviously Palace's fans as well. And therefore, there's going to be that extra edge to the game. Um, we had a, a goal that was wrongly disallowed at Selhurst Park a few weeks ago. So there's that extra bit of in, <laughs> ingredient in the game as well. Um, and, you know, it's one that everybody at the start of the season, whether you're a Brighton fan or a Palace fan, looks for in the calendar. And uh, the fact that it's a night game, it's under the lights, it's going to be a full, full, full house again with, with the crowd there making a lot of noise on, on both sides. It's going to be a, a good occasion. So... The, the, the other side of that is that we try and keep the preparations as, as calm as possible. So Roberto and his coaching staff will be preparing for the game just like any other game. But they're obviously aware that it means so much to the fans. Yeah, so when I look at Brighton's season so far, it's, there's been a lot of change, obviously, with the manager, players leaving midway through the season. So how do you sort of create succession plans? Because I think in terms of what Brighton are so good at, everyone thinks, OK, they lose a player or a manager but they still keep the momentum. So, for instance, Graham Potter leaving, Roberto coming in, Cucurella going for big money, Esther Pinanan coming in to the club. So how does that sort of succession plan sort of manifest itself? Well, I think when you're a club of our size, you, you have to accept that if you're playing well, doing well, progressing, then there's going to be more attention on your club, more scrutiny of your club, and therefore more interest in your players, your coaches and your staff. And if you, if you know that that's going to happen, it gives you the opportunity to plan in advance. So we try and look at probably the top 20, 25 positions in our club on and off the field and try and understand what we would do if we lost any one of those 20, 25 people. And 
having a plan to, to, to replace people is in, in this business really important because it means if you lose Trossard to Arsenal, you know that there's Matoma ready to, to step in and, and play perhaps more games or Sarmiento to come in and play more games. If you lose a Basuma to Tottenham, you know you've got a Cachedo who's there ready to play those games. Um, and, and even with Graham Potter, although you don't want to lose a coach a month into the season, that's not good for anyone. Knowing who his successor could be, if that happened, is half the battle of trying to replace a good coach like Graham Potter. And we've been aware of Roberto's talents in, in Italy and also in, in Ukraine for some time. And in some ways, although I wouldn't say it was lucky that there's a war, obviously, in, in Ukraine, the fact that there is a war in Ukraine meant that Roberto wasn't working with Shakhtar Donetsk. He was available. And so when Graham went to Chelsea, we were able to move for our number one choice and he was keen to come to us. And of course, what he's done, the work he's done has been incredible. And he's taken the fantastic foundation that Graham Potter laid and he's taken us on to, a, to another level. Um, and that's credit to him, credit to the players. But it's also credit to the philosophy of the owner and the, and the chairman here, Tony Bloom, who pushes us to make sure we have succession plans, pushes us to make sure we're ready for any eventuality. And, and that's part of my job day to day, to make sure that if we were to lose a Dan Ashworth to Newcastle, yeah. we've got a David Weir, Weir yeah. sitting there waiting to, to step up. If we lose a Paul Wynn Stanley, our head of recruitment to Chelsea, then we've got Sam Jewell sitting behind him, ready to step up. And those are, those are the sorts of things that, that don't um, guarantee you uh, progress or, or, or easy succession, but they give you a good chance. And, you know, that's the philosophy that we work with. Yeah, because Paul, I just want to dig a little deeper because I remember when Leandro Trossard was being linked with a move to Arsenal and I was thinking, Phew, that's for me, in my opinion, Brighton's best player. He's been fantastic, scoring a hat-trick against Liverpool, being one of your players of the season so far. So, like... How do you guys come to the decision to say, you know what, OK, you can go off to Arsenal. We're not going to hold you ransom and we'll replace you. Like, what's the thinking behind it? Well, the thinking is really that, that, that we will always allow a player to progress his career, provided it suits us as well. So in the case of, of, of Leandro, he's done a fantastic job for our club for, for several seasons, was our top scorer in the first half of this season. But he was also getting to 27, 28 years of age. His contract was, was beginning to run down. He was keen to build on the success he'd had in England and also with the national team of Belgium. And if a big club, a bigger club came in to, to take him, um, providing the price was right for us, providing the contract was right for him, provided the timing was right for us, uh, then we would, we would be open-minded to doing the deal. And, and that's ended up what happened. Um, and of course, with Matoma, already in the building with Jeremy Sarmiento already in the building, Julio Enciso already in the building, and then this January, Buonanotti as well. We had lots of different options where we felt that we could let Trossard go um, and still not weaken our, our team or our squad. Um, and at the same time, bring in a transfer fee that enables us then to reinvest in younger players uh, again. So all round, it, it worked for, for, for Leo, but it also worked for our club. And uh, obviously, he's doing well at Arsenal, and we're delighted about that. Even as a Spurs fan, I can say that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, delighted for Leo. Um, and you know, f from our point of view, it, it shows also for other players who, who are thinking about coming to Brighton that that we not only give them a chance to play first team football in the Premier League, but when you know a, a bigger club comes in who are playing potentially at a higher level in, in the future Champions League or whatever then they won't have a barrier put in their way to progressing. And, and that's good for us as well as for them. Yeah, so one thing that maybe fans don't see is sort of the agitation behind the scenes. Because I know when Leandro left, there's a period where he was left out of the games. There was rumours that he travelled to Belgium, that he was sort of pushing for that move to, I think it was Tottenham at the time, then Arsenal came onto the scene. As a CEO, as a leader of a big corporation, so how do you deal with those things? Well, first of all, you know, the club has to come first. So we, we will manage those situations however best suits the club. And we want to protect Roberto and the rest of the players because if a player is thinking about moving, maybe their head isn't fully in, in our game. And we've got to be aware of that. And obviously the coach is aware of that. And we've still got to do whatever it takes to win the next game. And, you know, every situation that I've come across over the years has been different. Sometimes players remain entirely focused because that's, type of person they are and they keep playing until the time they don't and they move on. 
Other players become very distracted and, and therefore it's more difficult for them to play because they, they've got their head in a different place. And, and sometimes there's lots of outside influences, whether it's media, podcasts, uh, <laughs> <laughs> agents or, or whatever, that are all sort of speculating about you know, what, what that player's future might be like. And you just simply have to manage it in the moment. You can't have a script, in, in my experience anyway, you can't have a script that says, in this situation, this is what you do, or in that situation, this is what you do. You just have to, have to feel it and, and, and try and manage it as best you can. Mm, because Moses Caicedo was another example, you know, just in the January transfer window that just, just went, Chelsea bidded, I don't know, 55 million, and Arsenal obviously built, bid 70 million pounds, and I was doing some so research. So, so they, they say, so they, they, say. Say. So they, they say. say, obviously you're the man. I noticed I wasn't nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, what's the process? Because I've done some research, and I saw that Tony Bloom trusts you to have the number in the mind of what it will take to get a player out of the club. Were Arsenal close to hitting that number with the 70 million pound? Or was it sort of like a moral principle at stake? So it's not the money, it's about principle. Only if they wanted half the player, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, joking aside, we, 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 we never provide numbers. So it always sort of amuses us when we see numbers in the media because they've not come from us. And, and no, so I'm talking about yeah. internally that Tony has a price on each one of the players. That if, if this number's hit, then we've got to consider doing business. Yeah, that, 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 I think that's the same in any business where the, the owner will always have a, an understanding of what his assets are worth. Um, and of course, that can vary. It, you know, for us in January, selling Moises wasn't a good move because first of all, he was one of our best players in the first half of the season. And secondly, we were in a great position in the league. We were still in the FA Cup. We still had a lot of football to play. Um, and we want to try and achieve our best ever finish in, in the Premier League. And if we if we do achieve that, there's a there's a chance that we could qualify for European competition. So the stakes for us in the second half of this season were higher than ever. And Moises is a big part of that. But he's also a young player who's still learning his game. Um, he's in a faraway country from, from, from where he was born. And therefore, we also have a responsibility to try and do the best for the player long term as well as in the short term for us. And we felt that that was best served by keeping Moises with us, trying to do the best we can for the rest of this season. And then what will be in the future will be. And Moises is a top, top class player. And, and he yeah. has the potential to be anything he wants to be, <laughs> anywhere he wants to be. And um, therefore, this isn't, this isn't, you know, the one and only transfer window when Moises is going to be a popular uh, attraction for other clubs. And I think, you know, when we sat down with him and talked about that, and once all of the heat of the window had gone out and we were able to agree a new contract with him, settle him back down. And as you've seen in the last few games, he's beginning now to get back to that level that he was at in the first half. And he's such a lovely kid. He's such a lovely uh, person as well as a terrific footballer. You know, we're really happy that, you know, he settled back down. And as I said, his chance will come in the future to be whatever he wants to be. And uh, we're all very, very confident that will happen for him. And again, I talk about leadership. I like the way Brighton sort of got ahead of the situation in terms of saying, listen, stay away from training for a few days, come back into the fold because... As we've seen in sort of big corporations over the last three, four days, you know, maybe leadership hasn't been the best. I think we all know what we're talking about. So, yeah, uh, that was commendable. Yeah, you have to, sometimes you have to take charge of the situation for, for the young person here. You know, it's very easy, I think, sometimes because there's so much profile for footballers, so much interest in their lives and what they're doing and their careers, that it's easy to forget that at 20, 21 years of age, you know, you don't have a lot of life experience. Yeah, yeah. You, you need people around that can say, look, you know what? It's probably best if you just have a few days off. Just take you out of the, the, the spotlight. Take the heat away from you. Let the people around you that have to manage these situations do that. You just relax. Focus on having a break. And then when the transfer windows close, back to training, back to playing. Focus again on your football. And... It's not easy sometimes if you're 20, 21 years of age to, to see that that's the best option at, at that time. And so you need someone to almost take charge of that. And of course, agents are sometimes in the best place to, to advise in that situation. And sometimes they're not because they've also got, in, in, in many cases, a motivation yeah. or an interest in the transfer happening. And therefore, they're not always the most independent judges in, in that situation. Um, but 
we all have to coexist. We all have to work together to to, to make these things work. And um, for Moises, we felt we took the right course of action. And as I said, he's playing really well again. So we're, we're delighted. Yeah, in regards to um, Moises Caicedo, there's like reports that came out at the time that the contract has almost got like a top six release clause. So if a club hits, let's say X amount in the summer, Brighton will say, you know what? Fair play, you can go. Is that... You know, we don't operate like that and, and we try and avoid things like that because they become they become such a point of discussion and negotiation that you spend mm. hours and hours on something that may never happen or if it does happen it may not be the right price at the right time so we try and avoid things like that um, we, we know other clubs use them that's fine but but it's not not something that we we tend to get involved with and also talk to us about Roberto De Zerbi because when he joined the club, he was replacing, I would say, Big Boots and Graham Potter, who was doing a terrific job. Obviously, he's gone on to Chelsea. And I remember the first five games, results didn't go his way, but the football was still there. You can see the philosophy, the aggressive nature of the players on the pitch, pressing the space, all of that kind of stuff. So how important, or should I say, how easy was it for you to stick to the process, knowing that you can see the principles on the pitch, it just needs time yeah I mean that's a really important point because so often underlying performances are are a better indicator than results okay. so in those first five games I think we took two points out of a possible 15 and people were saying oh <laughs> wheels are coming <laughs> off and you know this is the impact of Potter leaving and De Zerbi doesn't know the Premier League and here, here, <laughs> here, here we are um, but the performances actually were so much better than the, the two draws and three defeats. And people also forget that I think we had Manchester City in that 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 cycle of games and and you know some some tough games. And Liverpool, Liverpool yeah. were there with a draw, and and I think um, you know Roberto was still getting used to a new country, getting used to the Premier League, getting used to a new squad, getting used to coming up against fierce competition week to week. And with all due respect to Serie A and to the Ukrainian league. There are some top teams and top players in those leagues, but the intensity of competition week after week is different. You know, you might play top teams one week and then teams that are of lesser ability the following week. In the Premier League, everybody's capable of beating everyone. Yeah. So you, you don't get any easy games. Um, but very quickly, we could see that the underlying performances were better. What Roberto was trying to achieve was, was exactly what he said he would. And then very quickly, I think, after the, the game against Chelsea that we won here 4-1, um, things turned around and I think now out of the last 12 games I think we've won seven drawn three lost two something like that so the performances have been fantastic we're I think the fourth or fifth highest goal scorers in the Premier League we're the highest goal scorers away from home in the Premier League yeah. um, and at the moment in terms of sort of past completion and touches on the ball I think we're second only to Manchester City so mm -hmm. you know these are statistics yeah. that are phenomenal when you consider that Roberto still hasn't even completed uh, half a season properly with us yet, you know. So um, it's been it's been an interesting journey. But as I said earlier, we've still got so much football to play, and nobody here is getting carried away. You know, there's still nothing achieved yet. You know, March is great, and it's good to be seventh. It's good to be in the FA Cup quarter final, but that's not the end game, and and no one is focused on anything other than the end game, which is trying to achieve our best ever finish. Yeah, as you were saying, with all of those sort of bamboozling stats with Brighton featuring right at the top, that obviously comes with an expectation because in recent days, with Antonio Conte's future sort of basically up in the air, people saying he's going to leave at the end of the season, Roberto's name's come up in that conversation. I know a few days ago he sort of said, listen, I'm happy at Brighton, you know, I respect the club, I'm happy to do my work here. So already, even though Roberto has just come in, yeah. are you sort of working <laughs> away, plugging away? <laughs> yeah, no. You two are a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's part and parcel of what I said earlier about, you know, the, the more successful you are, the higher profile you get, the more scrutiny there is on you, the more likelihood people are going to look at your own staff and players and, 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 and therefore look at them for their own clubs. And we're aware of that, we're conscious of that, but we, we've certainly got no desire to see Roberto go anywhere for, for some time. But he's a hugely talented coach who, again, a bit like Moises Cachedo, could, could go on to be whatever he wants to be. Yeah. Uh, and he's still young, he's 43 years of age. I mean, he's got a lot of time left in, in coaching to, to be that top coach. And I think he really enjoys it here. I spent a lot of time with him this weekend in, in Leeds and, and coming back from Leeds with him. and. He's happy, he's really enjoying being part of the club and 
I think he's excited to see what he can get out of this squad. Um, and I think he believes there's more to come, which we certainly hope he's, he's right. So how is he as a personality? Because as fans, we just see him on the touchline, press conference, taking control of situations. But as a man, like... He's, he's passionate. He's funny. Um, he's incredibly hardworking, long hours, focused totally on his football. His family stays in Italy while he works in England, um, which kind of shows you how focused he is yeah. day to day, week to week. Um, I think he's 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 very keen to to win every game, which it sounds obvious. You'd expect coaches and players to want that, but the level of detail that he goes into to try and make that possible is incredible. And, and we love that work ethic. We love that commitment. Um, and it also, you know, when it doesn't work out, you'll also see the disappointment and the frustration because he's a passionate individual. And, um, you know, whether or not the Italian sort of culture and personality <laughs> comes through in those moments, you know, it's hard to say exactly, but, but certainly we, you know, he's a different personality to Graham. And, you know, we've had to adjust to that that, that personality difference, but in a positive way. And we love working with him. Mm, so how is Graham? Because that's a perfect segue sort of into the next question. Obviously, he left Brighton to move on to Pastures New and moved to Chelsea where, you know, by all accounts, it's been a bit of a struggle. We're happy to see that there's been a bit of an upturn in form in, in recent weeks. But prior to that, you know, there was a lot of worries from him in terms of getting frets and maybe people saying that the suit is too big for him at Chelsea, that he can't fit into it. But even though everyone within the game knows that he's a great coach. So how is it watching sort of Graham's career at Chelsea unfold? I mean, it's been hard for a few weeks because we, we would still see Graham as a friend. I mean, he was my neighbour for three years. So, you know, we, we, got, we got to know each other very well and work together very well. But he, you know, Graham has a process the way he works. He has a particular style of working with players. And sometimes, you know, he will very often actually say that that takes time. It takes time to to get his systems and his processes into the way, you know, the players train every day and they play every week. Very often that's best established during a pre-season. He went into Chelsea, you know, a month into the season. Um, transfer window, last transfer window, they brought in a lot of new players. So the work that he'd done between September and January, to a large extent, had to almost start, not start again from scratch, mm -hmm. but... He had another group of players that he then had to work with and get his processes and his methods across. It will always take time if you're working with top clubs with expectations very high to to achieve the results that the fans expect. And at Chelsea, it's a it's a you know a, a bigger club than Brighton in terms of the history and the success that they've had. And therefore, because of that, the expectations of the fans are higher. So the pressure on Graham is higher. The demand for quicker results, better results, is 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 there all the time. But in my experience, he's calm, uh, he's confident in his own abilities, he's a very good person, so the players, I think, will respect him for, for, for the values that he has. Um, and, you know, I can't speak for Chelsea's owners or board, but, you know, certainly in our case at Brighton, we gave him the time that he needed to get his methods across. And three seasons into that work, we finished in our highest ever position in the club's history. That in itself is is testament to what he can achieve. And... You know, with all due respect to the squad of players we've got, which is excellent, you know, Chelsea are able to spend much higher sums of money, you know, on players that are the finished article quicker. So, you know, if he's given time working with some of the world's best players, who knows what's possible there? And I think I just want to narrow down on recruitment a little bit more because for me, Arkstedge, he's a yeah. testament in terms <laughs> of Matoma, the most he's the player I want to watch most in the Premier League right now. And when you hear players like, let's say, Mikhailo Modric going to Chelsea for, for 90 million, and you see Matoma at Brighton for, how much did you guys see? A lot less than that. <laughs> okay, you're not going to tell us the price. Yeah. <laughs> like, what is the strategy? Obviously, you, you can't, can't give the secrets, answers. Of yeah. course. <laughs> sure. But how do you identify talent? Well, we, you know, we, first of all, we have to fish in different ponds. To, to the biggest clubs in the country because, first of all, we can't afford to fish in the ponds that they're fishing in. And very often, the biggest fish in those ponds are going to be the sort of players that will want to go to Champions League level clubs immediately. Mm. So, first of all, we, you know, we, have to, we have to look in those, those different places for players. We use a lot of data to help us identify them because those other places are perhaps not as well known, not as well covered 
Um, scouts can't be everywhere, so you have to have a process which narrows down the players that are of interest to you. And we're also prepared to take a risk perhaps on younger players that the bigger clubs don't need to take a risk on because they can afford to buy the more established players. And then once those younger players are here, we have a, a number of different pathways for them. If they're good enough, like Bunanati, they can come straight in at 18 years of age to our first team squad. And now he's been rewarded with a call up to the full Argentinian team at 18, which is incredible. <laughs> uh, or we can move them on loan to a club elsewhere in Europe. So they get a bit of time out of the spotlight of the Premier League, out of the pressures of the, the Premier League to develop a bit further living in Europe. Or we can loan them to a club at a lower level in England. So they get used to the country and the language, but they're not again in the in the spotlight of the Premier League. And then when they're ready, the idea then is to, to, to bring them back into our first team squad at a time when perhaps we're about to sell one of the more established players. So in the case of Moises Casado, who was on loan in Belgium, there was increasing speculations about Basuma moving on. We bring Moises back. Tottenham come in for Eves. Eves goes out and Moises is ready to, to play. And that's how we try and, and manage our recruitment where you know to the best of our ability. Because if you can get a player in the door before you need him, not only can you prepare him and get him used to the way the coach wants to play and his teammates, but you're then not under pressure when the player above him leaves because people always know if you've just sold a player, you're, you've got lots of cash. And yeah. therefore those negotiations are going to be much harder. Yeah. So if we can get a player in before we need to, it makes our negotiations a bit easier as well. It's not always perfect. It's not a perfect system. We don't get everything right. We, we, we do make mistakes on recruitment, like every club. But the more time we spend in the Premier League, the more time we work with the, the, the coach, the more time our recruitment staff understand what he needs, the less chance there is of those mistakes happening regularly. They'll still happen because footballers are human beings. You know, they may have the best ability in the world. They may uh, love the idea of the Premier League or the UK. But for whatever reason, when they arrive, they just don't settle or it doesn't work for their family or there's pressures from a, from a different place that means that their performance is affected. So there's always going to be a potential for a player however well recruited, not to work out. But our job is to minimise that and, and obviously as well to then develop the player once they're here and when they're ready to move on to make sure that we're making good transfer profits because that enables us to invest for the future as well. Yeah, so with Matoma, I've read his story, started off in Japan, then obviously another one of the clubs that Tony's got a majority shareholding in. You sign him, you loan him to, him, loan him to the football club for a season, then he comes back to Brighton and the second half of the, half of the season, he's been a very, you know, big revelation in terms of that. And I even read that he studied like a thesis in dribbling. Yeah. It's yeah. fair to say that he got first class distinctions, <laughs> uh, you know. So how is he as a man? Because I think Brighton fans are sort of lapping him up as, you know, this is the guy that's going to take us forward. So how is it? Sort of integrate with he, he's, he's, I mean, he's so exciting to watch, isn't he? And and you know, when I was growing up, wingers used to be my favourite player. You know, they were quick, skillful, tricky, scored goals, assisted with goals. And in a way, for me at least, he's a little bit of a throwback to those times when there were you know top wingers in 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 the top level of English football because he he's got all of those attributes. He's he's great on the ball. He's a great dribbler. He's got this incredible speed. And we always sort of marvel at the way he can get to the he can get to the sort of the the the, the goal line and somehow cut across the face of the goal <laughs> where there's no space. And it's hard to understand how he does that, but maybe his education and the thesis that he studied on dribbling <laughs> helps. Yeah. Um, but he was a university player. We we identified him quite early. Played a little bit in Japan. We moved him across to Belgium, where he, he acclimatized to European uh, way of life. He's a quiet guy, very modest, very humble. Um, you know, if you see him around the training ground or, or in the team hotel before matches, he's, he's just a very, very normal, down-to-earth <laughs> guy. But when he gets onto the football pitch, he, he comes alive. Yeah. And um, I, I don't think there's a, a, a right-back in the country that wants to, to play. <laughs> We're against. Liverpool fans. Yeah, we saw Liverpool what he done to Trent. Trent's well, Trent's a fantastic player yeah. and, and, you know, a really, really top, top-level player. And... You know, I think he did have a hard time against Carew and, um, you know, Carew will do that to anyone. You know? <laughs> that's the thing. That's the, you know, that's the potential that he has and the, the quality that he has. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're excited. 
obviously is another player that no doubt is going to be in the spotlight again <laughs> yeah. come the next transfer window. But, you know, we, we're, we're ready for that and we understand that. Um, we just hope that he can have a great second half of the season, you know, in the way that he's, he's started it. Do you almost fear being too successful? So, for example, in your instance, you may have the fast track con contract situations. For example, the Zerbi, maybe in the summer, you might have to sit down with him. Matoma, he's going to attract interest, so maybe you have to sit down with him. So, like, do you almost fear being too successful because that comes with its problems? Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> You're right in some ways, is that, you know, the more the more success you have, the more vulnerable you become. <laughs> it's a sort of a strange sort of, uh, situation. But I think, I think, as I said earlier, I think, you know, a club like ours that has been around for 122 years, but has mainly played in, in the bottom two divisions of, of, the, of the pyramid, you know, we're on a journey and this is part of that journey. You, you, you know, we've got, to, we've got to wise up and we've got to toughen up to that situation. And I think, I think we're realistic about what can happen. But we're also quite prepared to stand our ground when we need to. You know, if we've got a player on a good contract or if we, we, we've got um, someone that we think actually it's not right for them to leave at this moment, we can say no. And we're lucky in the sense that we're not a club that, from a financial point of view, has to sell players to survive. We're, we're very fortunate in that respect. And I think that puts us in a really good position when it comes to negotiations. Um, and I think the other point I would say is that we're very honest with players. You know, we'll we'll say to them, look, you know, we think you should be here for another year or another six months or another 18 months. And at that point, if the right move um, uh, materialises, we'll help you achieve it. And the players trust us to keep to our word. And that helps us as well, because going out when you're recruiting is very rare that you're recruiting a player where you're the only club interested. Very often there could be two or three or four or more clubs interested. If you've got the reputation for bringing a player in, giving him a pathway to the first team, then when opportunities come in the future that enable that player to progress, the player's more likely to choose your club than, than another. And so, again, it's a balancing act because you don't want people to think you're just some kind of stepping stone. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, that's our edge when it comes to recruiting players, that we do have a pathway to our first team. If you're Manchester City, there are lots and lots of players in that, in that sort of process that could block your pathway to the first team so therefore you have to be an exceptional player to, to make Pep's 11 uh, or Jurgen's 11 at Liverpool you know th these are exceptionally big clubs with incredible squads and great talent all the way through their their system um, you know we don't have that level of depth we don't have that 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 sort of comfort so therefore we can provide perhaps a faster pathway and, and that can be attractive to players. So how important is developing your own local talent that like we've seen Solly March, Lewis Dunk, you know, I know Brighton recruit from abroad and stuff, but this is a community club. You know, when we came in today, everyone's smiling, welcoming you in. It's a real family affair. Yeah, yeah. You can sort of feel that hospitality. So how important is it to produce your next on Mitoma or Bissouma or, you know? Really important. I mean, we spend many millions of pounds a year um, on our academy, on recruiting, attracting and recruiting players from the local area, from even even up into your part of the world in South London to try and to try and, you know, get get them down here. Because we're never gonna have the kind of budget to enable us to go into the transfer market and spend big money. We we have to find ways of either recruiting in those those different ponds that I talked about earlier and bringing players from other countries, or we have to develop our own. And, you know, players like Lewis Dunk and Solly March Evan Ferguson, who we brought in from Ireland, um, and there are yeah, <laughs> again another one. He's only eighteen. Yeah. He's only eighteen. Um, and and they're you know they're really important to us as well because the more the more our academy can be successful, um, and by successful I mean either providing players like Evan who can come into our first team, or if those players coming through our academy are not quite good enough for our first team, but we can move them on to other clubs for fees then again, that enables us to reinvest that, 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 that income in developing talent for the future or buying talent for the future, which is a different way of competing with Liverpool, Man City, Arsenal, Tottenham, Chelsea and so on. We don't have the money to pay for big transfer fees, so we've got to find ways of doing it differently. And the academy is a really big part of that. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about your role on the Premier League Board of, board of Directors. You know, recently we've seen a lot of stuff come out on Manchester City's over 100 breaches and stuff like that. So I saw on, I think it was Mail Online, a picture of all the big executives, yourself, 
Tony was there, Amanda Stavely, Todd Burley. So from your perspective, being CEO of Brighton and seeing the alleged the breaches that were committed, what's your view on it? Well, I mean, first of all, I can't, I can't talk about the specific breaches because I'm not, I'm not privy to, to all the details. But, you know, we as a, as a general principle know that there are rules on the pitch and off the pitch. And it's a responsibility for all of us to make sure that we comply with all of the regulations. And it's up to the Premier League and its and its um, it, it, its executive team and its advisors to determine whether Manchester City have breached any regulations. And I don't know whether they have or they haven't. But it's a big responsibility for all of us because the competitiveness of the league is really important. And you know the the, the systems that are there on the field are designed to ensure it's eleven against eleven. You know, no one would put a twelfth player on the field because it's against the rules. So likewise, off the field, there are limits set to what we can we can spend. There are limits to various other sort of financial aspects of our business, and we have to comply with those rules as well. So. You know, for us, and, and I'm sure every club in the league, if anyone steps outside of the rules on or off the pitch, you know, there are likely to be sanctions. And that's that's the way it is. So we'll see what transpires with, with, with City. And, and that's, as I say, a matter for the Premier League, not, not for individual clubs. And so what's your view on the independent sort of regulator that has been sort of brought in to to facilitate the Premier League? Do you have any sort of views on it? Um, mixed views, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that the government think it's necessary to, to, to regulate football. But I also understand that various things that have happened over the last few years, whether it's been European Super League or Project Big Picture, have probably uh, not helped our case to maintain regulation of ourselves. And it's particularly disappointing when you've got a football association, a Premier League, uh, an EFL, 92 professional clubs, all of us have really talented people. All of us, I'd like to think, you know, have integrity. Um, all of us, I'd like to think, love the game, respect the game, respect the way the game operates, the pyramid system, the meritocracy. I'd like to think we all respect our fans and want to communicate transparently with fans. But I also understand if that's not happening, then because it's our national sport and because it's so important to so many people and we employ so many people that the government feel maybe that they need to oversee certain aspects of what we do. I hope that it's as fewer aspects as possible. I hope that the cost is is, is minimal because every penny that goes out of the game is taking away from the game. Yeah. So we just don't want lots of regulation that, that costs a, f a huge amount of money. Um, because I genuinely believe that a lot of clubs, most clubs, the majority of clubs, do respect all of the things that the regulator or the government's white paper are designed to to oversee um, and therefore you know it's now up to football to make sure that we, we we ensure that we're on top of our game in every respect so that the regulator doesn't have to intervene in the way we run our businesses very often or at all um, but we are where we are and we have to respect the government's decision now and we have to work with it to make sure that that we give the best possible um, uh, entertainment and service to our supporters and to the country as a whole. Yeah, because a lot of the furore has been around, you know, state-owned ownership, as we've seen with the breaches or alleged breaches that Manchester City have committed. Obviously, Newcastle being employed or owned, should I say, by a state-owned company. And Manchester United, Manchester. you know, Liverpool, these sovereign clubs are being linked with state ownership. Do you have any sort of view on state ownership? or? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the most important thing is that the league is competitive because as a football fan, whether you support Liverpool, whether you support Brighton or, or, or whoever your team is, you, you want to be able to believe in the dream that your club can actually achieve the, the most it can achieve. So in our case, 25 years ago, we were almost out of business. We were bottom of League Two as it, as, as it is now. Um, we were a game away from going out of the league and possibly out of, 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 of existence. 25 years later, through a good owner, fantastic support from the fans, great support from the community, some good management decisions along the way, we're now seventh in the Premier League. There was no regulator to protect us 25 years ago. There was no government, actually, to protect us 25 years ago. A lot of what we've achieved, we've achieved from hard work and, and great connection with fans and community. So it is possible for a club like us to progress all the way through the pyramid on our own, if you, if, if you like. Without yeah, but some may government. say that, you know, 25 years ago, there wasn't the, I don't know, state ownership. There wasn't the Roman Abramoviches. Sure. 
and things and, and that's like that's fair and 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 therefore you know the, the most important thing is that any kind of state ownership you know we're, we're not in favor because it potentially gives those clubs a significant that financial advantage sure. over us but again we are where we are we, we can't we can't keep looking back and saying if only if not if this and that. <laughs> yeah, yeah we've got to deal with the, the here and now yeah. So the best way we can deal with it here and now is to make sure the regulations are, are as tight as possible, that there are controls on, on spending so that the league maintains its competitiveness. But also, we don't go down the route of a European Super League where a small number of clubs are guaranteed their place and clubs like ours and, and like others can't progress and strive for that top-level football. Um, if you take that meritocracy away, if you take that dream away, mm -hmm. then you're completely changing everything all of us have grown up with yeah. in, in this country. And, and I don't agree with that. I don't think state ownership necessarily leads to that. Um, I don't think necessarily, you know, there, there is a, a, a way in which state ownership forces that to happen. But we've just got to be careful that we don't lose our competitive nature from the top of the pyramid to the bottom, because that's what we all love. That's what we all talk about. When I worked in North America, it was the only thing people wanted to talk to me about the pyramid and how it works and promotion and relegation and how do you cope with that and all of the pressure that comes with that. So we want to maintain that. We want to maintain that competitive spirit and hopefully we can for many years to come. And lastly, from me, I just want to, as a Tottenham fan, you know, what do you make of how the club is operating? I know you've got Harry a, Harry Kane, I know you've got a great relationship or you've worked with Daniel definitely in the past and from the media side of things, oh, shrew Daniel, <laughs> or he doesn't like to spend. Himself. But you've worked with him for several years. So like, knowing Daniel as you do, what yeah, could you tell like the well, first, first of all, like, you know, speaking as a Spurs fan and, and as a former director of the club, I think what Daniel's achieved is, is incredible. And, you know, building a stadium of that quality, putting the training ground in place at the level that they have and the quality that they have, these are really important foundations and infrastructure to to a club of, of any type, but of Tottenham's type where you know they've got a global following, it, it's critical. I also understand as a fan that, that winning matches and winning trophies is really important as well. And you know, it would be crazy for any Spurs fan to think that's not what Daniel wants either, because I know he does yeah. very, very much. Um, but it's hard. You know, we all want that. And every club wants that. And every club is competing for a very small number of trophies each year. And it's getting harder and harder and harder to, to, to win. So, you know, I know that, you know, knowing Daniel personally and having worked for him, I know how much he cares and, about the club and how passionate he is. I also know running a different club, how difficult it is to get every decision right all of the time. I also know how difficult it is to please all of the fans all of the time. It's just it's just so difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm a competitor to Tottenham, you know, week in, week out. So obviously we want to do the best we can for Brighton. Um, so you're still a Tottenham fan or is it, <laughs> do you look for their results of on course, the video printer? No, of course, <laughs> yeah. Brighton's first and foremost yeah. because, you know, Tony Bloom and, and the board of directors here pay my wages and, and you know, I, I'm in charge of leading this club. So for me, Brighton's results are always priority, uh, even when we play Spurs. But after that, of course, you know, I was born a mile from White Hart Lane. It's It's hard for me to to take that club out of my system entirely. So I always look for their results and I want them to do well. But, you know, as I said, it's it's so difficult. It's so tough. Uh, and I, if I can get back to, to watch games on my day off, I, I do. Um, and I'm always, I'm always sort of, you know, in awe of what they've achieved in terms of their infrastructure. But like all fans, you know, you, you want to see wins and, and trophies. And, and, you know, that's something which uh, is hard to achieve in, in any football club. Paul, cool. it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I think just last one before we wrap up. Um, what do you get up to outside of football? We've peppered yeah, you on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, peppered yeah because you on. people see chief executives and they just feel like managing work, work, a football. Work. But outside yeah. of football, what do you sort of do? Yeah, well, I've got I've got three kids. Um, you know, all adults now. T two of them work in football as well. So that's oh. you know that kind of takes up a bit of time and, and uh, my son runs uh, you know a couple of fitness businesses so I'm interested in seeing how that's a real fitness <laughs> guy so maybe <laughs> yeah seeing how he gets on with yeah. that and how he operates as an entrepreneur and and I like to run I, I like to spend some time with friends and, and relax but I do still watch a lot of football it's something that's been in my blood since I you know first played the game when I was just about six or seven years of age so it, it's hard to it's hard to sort of switch off from the game because it, it is a seven day a week business to run but it's also available seven days a week and and you know I'm just as likely to 
to stop by my local park and watch a kids game or come here to the academy at the weekend and watch our, our youth teams play or as I was on Sunday watching our women's team play against Manchester City I still I still have this I need this well, fix Paul, but how, how do you disconnect from a I'm sure <laughs> transfer window every second your phone is going off this agent this club how do you disconnect from the game? Can you? I don't think you you probably can. And and Paul is sitting over there. I've heard this many times. You know, it's hard. It's hard to disconnect because this is a twenty four seven business. And the only way I think you can stay relatively sane is not to get too high on the highs and not to get too low on the lows. If you can somehow stay in the middle, then that gives you a perspective and that gives you a, a sense of calm. Um, of course, that means you still get excited in games and you still get disappointed, but you don't allow your energy to be consumed at both ends of the spectrum. Because if you do, then I think you know your mental health starts to get affected, your your personality starts to get affected, and after sort of you know this is season twenty six or twenty seven now I can't remember, I've, I've learned to control those emotions better. And um, you know, as I say, my run every day. No music, no people running with me, run at my own pace, slow most days. Um, but that's my time. That's my time to get my thoughts together, get some fresh air, get some exercise. Um, and that's what I enjoy. And, you know, as I say, it sounds boring, um, but, you know, that, that's me. And um, maybe, maybe I am boring, but, um, but no, I love the game. And, and I'll, I'll, never, I'll never switch off totally from, from watching football because it's, it's pretty much all I've known most of my life. Yeah, lastly from me, I just wanted to ask, like, what's your end game? Because you're a successful CEO <laughs> at Brighton, you've dabbled your toe in the big corporations in, in North America. Is there a desire for you to want to dominate another sphere or are you sort of primor- primarily focused on football? Football mainly. I love F1. I mean, if, if uh, the F1 guys want to, you know, take me on at some point <laughs> and I'm done with football, that would be great. Uh, you know, I just love the, uh, I love that sport just because of the, the focus on performance and the detail that goes into preparing drivers and cars to, to race at 200 miles an hour. So there's a there's a level of, of performance there, high performance, which I can relate to from a professional sport point of view. And it's what we strive for here. But it also is another way of taking me away from thinking about football. So what, watching those guys in action is amazing. Um, but no, I haven't really got an end game. I mean, I, I've never had a I've never had a plan for my career. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> yeah. I've been really lucky that one thing has led to another, to another, to another. And all I've done is I've tried when I've had opportunities to take them and, and work as hard as I can. And that that's really um, been my plan all the way along. So at the moment at Brighton, this is season eleven. The chairman still wants me here. <laughs> the board still wants me here. Um, and you know that's good enough for me. Perfect. Paul, we have a closing tradition on this podcast where we ask the guests that's had the experience of the beautiful game to recommend a potential guest to come onto this platform in football. So off the top of your head, I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> if you had to recommend a potential guest in football to come onto this platform that you would help, and I'm sure Paul would help, <laughs> get onto the platform, who would you recommend? Can I pick an idol from the past? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's model. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is a guy who was one of the most talented, gifted players of his generation. You know, became England manager, um, became Tottenham manager, uh, became a fantastic pundit. Also, had a terrible yeah. uh, episode when he yeah. was when he was working with BT. But is a really good guy. Great talker. Loves the game. More interesting than me, <laughs> and, and definitely more talented than me. <laughs> uh, he would be my recommendation. Thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. We're going to leave it there. That's another episode of the Beautiful Game podcast. Until next time, over and out.